Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you uh, to this event. I'm Brian Barber, one of the class of new fellows at New America. So on behalf of New America, I welcome you f and uh, thank you for coming. Um, let me say at the outset that we didn't title this um, uh, ver very well. So we're certainly going to be talking uh, about more than just Gaza, uh, as, as you'll see. Um, the event is co-sponsored by the Foundation for Middle East Peace, and its president, Matt Duss, is going to introduce the, the panel and the event. Matt. Thank you, Brian, and, and thank you, everyone, for being here this morning for this conversation. Um, knowing all three of these uh, analysts, knowing their work, and, 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 and especially just coming after what we went through this summer um, with the Gaza War, um, I thought it was a great opportunity to talk with three of these people or have them talk to each other and, and, and we could listen because their work deals with the personal stories, the personal struggles, the personal impact. I think when we look at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the occupation, the blockade of Gaza as state-to-state -state problems, um, diplomatic issues, we, we often lose the, the human stories, I think, that, that really make up what's going on. Um, one of the reasons that Alice's book interested me, because she writes of the, of the weeks leading up to the Gaza War of this summer, um, being in the West Bank on a solidarity visit, I was also in Israel-Palestine at the time. Um, as I was just telling Alice, I was in Tel Aviv the, the evening that the bodies of the three hikers were found. Um, that next morning, I went down to the Negev to, for just a little bit of a break, basically off the grid for two days. And then when I returned to Jerusalem, uh, two days after that, uh, things had really gotten out of hand as, as I'd never seen them. And talking to Israeli and Palestinian friends, they felt the same way, just roving gangs of thugs looking for, for Palestinians to attack. Um, demonstrations in, in Palestinian-Israeli communities has, had not happened in many years and are happening right now as we speak. Um, so that's what appealed to me and, and, and Brian's work as um, having done years and years of research following young Palestinians now as they become older Palestinians with children of their own, tracking the impact of, of the conflict, tracking the impact of the occupation, the daily grind, the daily reality. Um, and Samer Badawi, who I've gotten to know just over the past few months, and a really excellent journalist with 972 Magazine who was there in Gaza during the war. Um, and who insists on calling it a war, and maybe you can, you can go into a little bit more about that, because I think that's a very, very interesting aspect um, of how the, how the Gazans themselves actually experience what happened this summer in Operation Protective Edge. So just by way of introduction, I'll start with Alice. Alice Rothschild is a physician, author, filmmaker, and longtime activist who has worked in the healthcare reform and women's movements for many years, and since 1997 has focused much of her energy on understanding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. She's the author most recently, of On the Brink, Israel and Palestine on the Eve of the 2014 Gaza Invasion, a co collection of blog writing that chronicles a fact-finding and solidarity visit to the West Bank and Israel during the last three weeks of June 2014. Those books are for sale just outside the door. Please make sure to pick one up. Brian Barber is the Jacobs Foundation Fellow here at the New America Foundation. He's writing a book narrating the lives of six men from the Gaza Strip who he has interviewed regularly for the past 20 years since they emerged as youth from the first Palestinian Intifada in 1993. He and colleagues will also be continuing two research projects funded by the Jacobs Foundation in Switzerland, an event history study of the current well-being of a representative sample of 1,800 of the same generation of Palestinians and a study of youth who participated in the Egyptian Revolution. Samer Badawi is a journalist and analyst. He writes mainly for 972 Magazine. Um, really privileged to have this panel up here today, so I'll turn it over to Samer. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. And thank you all for coming this morning. Um, I think that uh, it's, it's good to know that despite the fact that we're two months beyond the war, that uh, people are still interested in the issue because, in fact, the people of Gaza continue to suffer, um, not only under a long time siege, but also under the impact and the effects of uh, that 51-day assault on Gaza. Matt mentioned that um, there, uh, can you hear me OK, by the way? Because I've been accused of speaking very softly. And I want to make sure, OK, great. Um, Matt mentioned that uh, there is some difference of opinion among uh, observers of the, of the conflict in Israel-Palestine as to whether what happened this summer was, in fact, a war. And I can tell you that from personal experience, having lived and worked in both Afghanistan and Iraq and visited the Balkans on a couple of different occasions, 
Um, I have never been in a situation uh, where I have seen that level of violence leveled against the civilian population from air, from sea, and from land. And over the course of that 51 days, it's important to remember that not only did uh, 2,100 plus people uh, die in the Gaza Strip, but also that 501 of those people were children. Um, and so with that as context, uh, as Matt said, we're very privileged to have with us today uh, two experts on the region and people who, uh, like me, are recently returned uh, from that part of the world. What I propose uh, is that with, with your permission is that we have a conversation for about 45 minutes and then we'll open it up for questions because we have until noon today. And uh, we'll just have it as a, a sort of casual discussion, okay? And if there's anybody over the course of the Q&A that has a, a burning question, please feel free to raise your hand and we can uh, address that directly. So Alice, I'll start with you. Um, and uh, as you all know now, Alice has recently published a book on her experience in the West Bank uh, just prior to, to the beginning of the war. My understanding, Alice, is that you were in the West Bank uh, and in Israel for three weeks, um, just prior and then I think at the beginning of the war as well. And the book that we have with us today, which if you all have not seen it, it's available outside. It's called On the Brink, um, and it's on for sale outside, I think, for $17, if anyone is interested. Um, that's my plug. I'll only do it <laughs> once. Um, <coughs> but uh, my understanding is that the book is actually a collection of your blog posts mm -hmm. while you were there. So why don't you tell us a little bit about, uh, about the book and uh, how it fits okay. in with, uh, sure. with the subject at hand? So um, I've been involved with uh, co-organizing health and human rights delegations to the region uh, annually since 2003. And we had a delegation in June. So for 10 days, I was co-leading this delegation, examining issues of human rights and civil rights, both in Israel and the West Bank. And then we did, um, with some healthcare providers, four days of examining the healthcare system. And then I had a week of my own research. So you know, we traveled focusing in Israel on areas of conflict and dissent. We were in Tel Aviv, Yaffa, Nazareth, and Lod. Um, and then we were in East Jerusalem, Ramallah, Kalkilia, Hebron, Bethlehem, Berlin, as well as a number of smaller villages and refugee camps. And um, I was blogging very extensively, and I came home, and the next day, uh, Helena Coben uh, called me and said, your blog should be a book. So um, fast-tracked the book, and two months later, with some modifications and intro and uh, whatever, it came out. And I'm just going to quote a little bit from the book and then do some background and then do a reading. We visited mixed cities in Israel where the implications of an inherently racist society that benefits Jews over all other citizens is flagrantly obvious if you only stop to look. We visited cities and villages and refugee camps in the West Bank, where decades of occupation and checkpoints and permits and a ballooning Jewish settler population have strangled the Palestinian people. And we can go into more depth during the Q&A. It is painfully clear to me that the events of the last few weeks did not happen in a vacuum, that the occupation of the West Bank and the siege of Gaza, the growing Jewish settlements in the West Bank, the increasingly racist right-wing governments in Israel, and the very idea that Jewish suffering and Jewish exceptionalism gives us the right to eliminate or oppress another people created the environment for this explosion. This is not about the last 10 or 20 years. This is about the very unsettling consequences of Zionism itself. It is also clear to me, a committed pacifist and social justice advocate, that the ongoing Palestinian resistance, most thankfully nonviolent, is actually something I feel compelled to support, while rejecting all violence, state-sponsored and otherwise. I do not do this out of an undying love for Palestinians or any dislike of my fellow Jews. I do this because I have learned that Jews are capable of the same racism, hatred, and atrocities as anyone else. I do this because we must be held accountable for our actions and our beliefs. I do this because not doing this makes us into monsters who have lost all sense of moral compass. So when we got there, the big issue was that uh, Palestinians in administrative detention 
were on the longest hunger strike that they'd been on. And they were striking not for better food or something like that, but for the fact of ending administrative detention, which is the sort of uh, limbo land that Palestinians get into often activists, where they're arrested and detained without charges. It can go on for months, years. They can get re-detained, and it's a really oppressive thing. And so we thought this was going to be the human rights issue of our trip. And then on June 12th, uh, three Hebron settler youth were kidnapped. And while there is never an excuse for kidnapping youth, I think it is actually very important to remember that the Jewish settlers in Hebron are the most racist, fanatical Jewish settlers on the West Bank. They're the people who throw rocks into Palestinian homes and spray paint racist graffiti and have really made the center of, of Hebron a horrendous place for Palestinians to live. And the interesting thing was that um, <coughs> excuse me, Netanyahu immediately came out blaming Hamas, although he actually had no evidence for this. And it seemed kind of odd, because the West Bank is crawling with IDF soldiers. It's crawling with West Bank collaborators. And it was hard to believe that he was conjuring this up without any evidence. And then what was unleashed really felt to me, since I was in the West Bank at the time, to be like a pogrom. There was a massive military incursion. Over the course of time, 10 Palestinians were killed, 600 were arrested, including all of the Hamas leadership. And even more disturbing, there was this vitriolic incitement coming out of the leadership and the media in Israel. Um, you know, Arabs were called snakes. I mean, it was really pretty horrific. And then we saw Palestinians with Israeli citizenship being attacked by Jewish thugs, and then leftists, uh, Jewish Israeli leftists also being attacked. It was very, very disturbing. And what became clear to us is that Netanyahu wanted to stop the unity government between Hamas and Fatah. And he had been looking for an excuse. And he either you know, found his excuse or made his excuse. I have no idea. But this was really the underlying thing that was going on. And two weeks after the initial kidnapping, we found out that the IDF actually knew that the settler youth were dead one to two days after their disappearance. But they kept it a secret because they needed an excuse to invade the West Bank. And then the bodies were found, and I don't really know when they were found. And we had the abduction and burning to death of a Palestinian youth. And pretty horrifically, you know, it was very clear to us that this was a revenge killing. Uh, but the military police put out this rumor that he was gay and that this was an honor killing by his parents. And it was an example of how the media was being uh, manipulated. And then a Palestinian American was beaten by IDF soldiers during a protest. And when he got out of the hospital, he was put under house arrest for no particular uh, reason. And then when he left to go back to the US, his Palestinian family was targeted and arrested also for the crime of being his family. And then we saw East Jerusalem explode, as was mentioned. And you know, I would like to point out that that unrest continues to today. So many of my Palestinian friends are talking about a mini intifada that's focused on the ultra-Orthodox fundamentalists <laughs> demanding religious access to Al-Aqsa and the Dome of the Rock. Temple Mount for Jews, and I was in touch with I'm in touch with a number of medical students because we do a human uh, medical student exchange between Harvard and Al Quds, and one of them wrote to me just last week. The situation in the West Bank has turned to hell. A few hours ago, another accident happened in Nablus, in which one Palestinian and one Israeli were killed. After that, the Israeli soldiers closed the road, and there's an unbelievable traffic jam for hours. An hour ago, another incident happened in Hebron, and now Hebron is under bad conditions. A few moments ago, I just saw on the news that Israeli soldiers are invading the Janine camp for no reason, and still no more news is available. So the West Bank has also been simmering since uh, this whole thing erupted. Then going back to the events in June, Hamas launched uh, 30 rockets on the 30th. It's the first time since 2012. You could say the militants provoked uh, the war uh, that subsequently happened. You could also say they were provoked. It raises all the issues of what is Palestinian resistance, how does it look, when do Israelis notice it. And then a week later, there was the massive attack on Gaza. And I would like to point out that in a normal country, if three kids were kidnapped, there would be a criminal investigation. The people would be found. There would be a trial. There would be charges. There would be punishment. That's how normal countries function. But in this region, the abnormal has become normalized. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the reason for war, it initially started out that it was to avenge the youth being killed by Hamas, which actually had never been proven to do it. Then it morphed into, uh, we have to stop the rockets, because uh, militants were sending rockets into Israel, which was obviously completely unacceptable. And then it became to destroy the tunnels that existed between Gaza and Israel. 
And first of all, I get nervous when the reasons for war keep changing. Um, but the other thing is that the IDF knew about these tunnels for years, and they chose not to do anything. And that tunnels can be destroyed from either end. And um, I think it's important to notice that I uh, Egypt destroyed the tunnels between Gaza and Rafah from the Egypt end. They didn't have to invade Gaza to destroy the tunnels. And then ultimately, this war became a collective punishment on all of Gaza, a destruction of the infrastructure on the Hamas militants and leadership. It's the third time in less than six years, only the most aggressive time. And Netanyahu refers to this exercise as mowing the lawn. And for me, that's a particularly horrific kind of phrase. And the implication is that Palestinian men, women, and children have as much human value and importance to the Israeli military leadership as a blade of grass. If we look at what was the consequences of this war, according to the UN, there were 74 Israelis killed, uh, four civilians, 500 injured. And in Gaza, as was mentioned, over 2,100 people killed, 1,500 civilians, a third of them children. 12,000 people were injured, over 100,000 made homeless, 450,000 without any water, over 220 schools were damaged. Um, there are 370,000 children in need of direct psychological support for the consequences of trauma and war. If we look at what the military was doing, the Israeli military dropped 20,000 tons of explosives on a strip of land six by 26 miles in seven weeks and the Gaza militants shot 10 tons into Israel. There were 1,500 Palestinians with Israeli citizenship protesting this war that were arrested for demonstrating in Israel, which you would think is a civil right, and 600 of them were indicted. Um, there were Israeli human rights organizations protesting the war, but Salam and Yeshdin tried to read the names of the Gaza dead on an Israeli radio station. The radio station refused. They went to the courts, and the courts refused to allow them to read the names of the Gaza dead. So in Gaza, we now have children begging in the streets, a new phenomenon of prostitution and boat people being smuggled out to reach Europe because people are so desperate. And a leading uh, Israeli human rights activist told me that the main growth industry in Gaza now is human smuggling. Oxfam estimates at the current rate of rebuilding, it will take 50 years to rebuild Gaza. So I think it's important to understand both this larger context as well as the in intimate details to look at what kind of society is able to rally behind this kind of level of military aggression. Uh, during the war, 90 to 97% of Jewish Israelis supported the war. It's important to think about what does occupation and siege look like and to raise the whole issue of Palestinian resistance. And we live in an incredible disconnect between myth and reality. And I'm just going to close with um, a blog reading um, that is called, what is a terror Who is the Terrorist? Excuse me. Let's just say Bani Naim is a large Muslim village of 20,000, east of the city of Hebron, a region known for large stone quarries and miles of vineyards. I have been visiting an extended family, where most everyone is well-educated, teachers, businessmen, doctors, people with degrees in education who cannot find employment and, quote, jump the wall to find work in Israel or to get visas to do graduate work in the U.S. or do online Ph.D. programs in Islamic religion and Quranic studies. Families tend to be large. Babies tend to be loved and plentiful. It seems that everyone we meet is related. Their idea of a good time is sitting on a balcony with each other at sunset, drinking Turkish coffee, eating sweets, talking, and smoking Narjila. The main issue with the view, besides the stone quarry, is the Israeli military base in the distance and the spy balloon that hangs above the hills over the fanatically racist Jewish settlement of Kiryat Arba. The houses I visit are beautiful, meandering white stone Arab homes, surrounded by patches of olive, almond, lemon, fig, and apple trees, gardens with water-starved flowers, and aromatic bushes like lavender that burst with perfume when the sun sets. The love of the land and its bounty is palpable. Far from the center of town, there is a larger field with a greenhouse where I see rows of happy mulahia that gets concocted into this great green soup with rice. And then there's a field of wheat. Much has been passed down through the generations. The living rooms of these houses have big screen TVs and often some totally discordant American cowboy movie with Arabic subtitles or, or an overly dramatic soap opera from Saudi Arabia playing in the background. It is stunningly hot, and periodically someone talks about the four feet of snow that fell last week and paralyzed the village. The land is hilly, 
with single homes here and there, throw in some goat herds and minarets, and you keep looking, you can see the Dead Sea and the purple hills of Jordan. It is all pretty spectacular. This is the kind of family that warmly welcomes me into their home. The mother has prepared a ginormous meal of extraordinarily good food, which is made of rice and chicken and stuffed grape leaves and stuffed zucchini and yogurt and spices to die for. Everyone is behaving as if I have not eaten in days. So we talk, and then my host suggests that the family watch my documentary on the Nakba, Voices Across the Divide. It has Hebrew and Arabic subtitles. And I wonder, how will that play? A documentary produced by a Jewish secular woman for a US audience sharing the Palestinian story in a room full of devout Muslims. Is this chutzpah or foolishness? And so we talk and talk, and I say they have to be honest with me. Everyone wants to see it, and so they invite over even more relatives. And soon everyone is glued to the TV, and we're not watching Bonanza. I'm a bit freaked out since they keep talking, and I can't tell if this is good or bad. But it turns out this is a totally talkative, enmeshed family, and they're just having a big group experience. When the documentary ends, I hold my breath, and then the father speaks and says the film is an excellent portrayal of the Palestinian experience. And then everyone chimes in, and we have this amazing discussion about all of their stories and the making of the film, and the American Jewish community, and Zionism, and Islam. As you may imagine, this is a pretty stunning cross-cultural experience. And I'm so relieved. I feel embraced and welcomed despite my clear differentness. Perhaps I need more tea. And how about some nuts? So why am I telling you this story? When you hear a news report, these are the they, the Muslim other, the Palestinian militants near Hebron, the faceless families that are being terrorized by Israeli soldiers every night since the three boys or settlers or soldiers or who knows what or all of the above disappeared. The day after the disappearance, the Islamic Center and School for Boys next door was ransacked by the Israeli soldiers and the imam was detained for a few hours and then released. After our movie night and the sunset over Kiryat Arba, as we prepare for bed, I am informed that the Israeli Defense Forces have attacked the town. They are at all the entries and have started going house to house. The village has a Facebook page which is suddenly the focus of everyone's attention. Someone reports that three to four buses of fully armed soldiers are walking through the town. Some take control of one house and put a sniper on the roof. TV news is talking about an idea of attack on Rafa, the southern border of Gaza. The electricity flickers on and off. Why? The family is anxiously awake until the middle of the night, tracking the soldiers on Facebook and a local radio program. The father finally goes to the mosque to pray when the Muslim calls at 4 a.m., and then he comes home and goes to sleep. I learn that like many Palestinian men, he has been arrested twice and was in administrative detention for two months and released without any charges. He has obvious reasons to be anxious. He is a Palestinian male while Muslim, which is an arrest category in itself. No arrests are made here during the night, but everyone's nerves are a bit shattered and no one sleeps well. The youngest son is curled across his mattress and is in a deep stupor. I wonder, how does this all impact him and his sense of safety, his belief in his parents' ability to protect him? The press is reporting hundreds of arrests, many more injured, and a steady number of killings. Hamas members, including legislators, are clearly targeted. Earlier, we passed one of the big Bring Boy Back Our Boys signs. It hits me, this is supposed to resonate with the violent kidnapping of girls in Nigeria. I try to imagine a society where that slogan would mean all of our boys, not only the three snatched last week, but the thousands of mostly boys and young men lost in Israeli detention centers without parents or lawyers or the legal and human rights protections of any decent society. And then there are all those boys who have lost their humanity, breaking into houses night after night terrorizing families, turning into frightened, dehumanized monsters. And I realize we need to bring them back as well. Thank you very much, Alice. I, I almost feel like, yeah, a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. So. Um, it's little wonder that Alice is here with us today, actually, and, and thank you so much for painting such a vivid portrait of what you saw there and offering the context, uh, both factual and sort of emotional, of what happened in Gaza over the course of the summer. Um, and we'll have a chance to get back to you, actually, in a little bit to, to dig a little bit deeper on some of these issues. 
Um, but I want to turn to Brian now for just a second and, and ask you, Brian, now that you've listened to some of the very uh, sort of personal portraits that Alice has painted of individuals in the West Bank, um, you have, as I understand it, more than two decades of experience working with, uh, with Gazans in particular, Palestinians in Gaza, and more specifically with youth there. Um, and so you've had the opportunity to interact with them uh, as these violent episodes have taken place and of course over the course of the occupation and the siege. Um, having recently returned after the 51-day uh, assault, uh, can you describe to us what you saw there this time and how it differs from some of the previous experiences you had? Sure. First, let me say this is the first time I've met Alice and it's a real uh, honor to be with you, Alice. She did not ask me to say this, but uh, the book is really good. <laughs> um, I would highly recommend it. It's really very revealing and totally authentic in terms of my experience. I just kept nodding and marking the margin <laughs> and putting exclamation marks. Um, it's good also to be with you, Samer. Samer is a Palestinian and in many ways he's the expert on this panel and we hope that he will um, share his insights as well as just ask questions. So I'm going to speak with some authority um, about Palestinians uh, and Gazans, and I want to make clear at the outset that I, that I know the limits of that authority. Um, I'm not a Gazan, I'm not a Palestinian, I'm not an Arab, I'm not a Muslim, I'm not a Jew, I'm not an Israeli. I'm none of those things. I'm a upper middle class wasp from Los Angeles who through uh, serendipity has had extraordinary access into the lives of Palestinians throughout the territories, but predominantly Gaza. That started 20 years ago when, when I started living uh, with families in refugee camps out of a desire to appreciate, to learn the culture before I could sit on a stage like this and say something about them. And um, so, you know, it's that longevity and it's that exposure that, that gives me the confidence to say something about how things are going um, for them. I'm concerned mostly that, um, that Palestinians in general and Gazans in particular are just terribly misunderstood or ununderstood. Let me give one anecdote. Just a week ago, I was here in D.C. I'm new to D.C., by the way, and it's just amazing how many events are going on. And I was at a really good event last week, and a, a very, <coughs> very experienced uh, senior uh, D.C. official with lots of expertise uh, closed the session, summarized the session in a way that just really upset me. And he, ironically, he was making the, he was trying to make the point that um, the ferocity of this recent war um, was, was extreme and that therefore one could understand why Gazans might be, then he said, full of hatred and violence. Mm. And I, I raised my hand quickly, but the time was up. But I wanted to tell him that what he just said was not true. Mm -hmm. Gazans are not full of hatred and they're not full of violence. I know that from personal experience. So I, I hope to be able to kind of humanize uh, <coughs> Gazans in this case. And um, because I, I guess, I hope not too naively, if one, if we can, establish some human connections be between Palestinians, between Gazans and the powerful people, for example, who run this city, uh, m maybe some uh, policy changes might occur. We all know, the three of us and most of you in the audience know that this is not a problem that's going to go away. Mm -hmm. And uh, 50 years of experience tells us that the current modus operandi is not working. So something has to change. And so let me just um, try to answer your question, Samer, um, by giving the, the schizophrenic answer, which a Gazan would, would certainly want me to give. Um, you were there during the war, reported from it, so Samer uh, uh, knows from the ground what it was like to have the war descend. 
I got there a week or so after it ended. And um, look, the devastation on the eastern side of the Strip is, is just horrific. Um, it's just, there aren't words to describe it. Um, the eastern strip of the Strip is, of course, closest to the border. And, um, you know, as you drive from, from the center of the Strip, either wherever you are, north or south, towards the east, you see progressive evidence of the, of the war. And it's, it's really quite sobering because before you get farthest east, you, s you see the, the, the precision that military technology has. So you would drive and you would see one house totally flattened, but all of its neighboring houses completely untouched. It was, it was, for me, it was really very sobering to, to know that, that there are uh, weapons that can be that precise. Um, and then you move farther to the east, and the th then it's several houses on a street. Then it's an entire street. Then it's an entire neighborhood. And the reason for that, I learned, is because that's where the real fighting took place. It's not just because where the tunnels were, because some parts are too distant even for tunnels to have been uh, dug, but it's where there was resistance and fighting, and, and then the heavy, the heavy uh, artillery was used to just level things. So that, that's difficult, you know, I, there aren't words to describe that. You've seen pictures. I've taken hundreds of pictures. Um, but, but those, and, and we, know the, we know the counts, we know the casualty counts, um, but those are numbers. Mm -hmm. um, those aren't people. And so let me give a couple of anecdotes of just spontaneous conversations that I've had. Um, maybe I'll even start in the <coughs> early days, but then I'll focus on conversations I had just a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, to give you a sense of what Gazans think about, what they talk about, what they care about in the midst of this um, situation. So my first memory of talking uh, in Gaza, for example, uh, if, if the intent is to com communicate what a, a Gazan personality might be, um, uh, a young boy at the back of a, a schoolroom that I had been talking to, this has got to be 1996 or something, and I was new in Gaza pretty much, and, and I talked something, I forget what it was about the research we're doing. And, you know, the students are very polite, and, and, and Gazans uh, are especially humble, uh, quiet, um, deferent. Uh, and he raised his hand at the end, and he clearly needed to say something. Uh, and so he just made a plea. He said to me, please go home and tell Americans that we aren't all terrorists. That was a plea of his 20 years ago and gives the first, I think, feel of the personality of, of a sense, a, a very profound sense of being marginalized, of being stigmatized, mm -hmm. of knowing that the world has this view of us Gazans <coughs> as hostile, angry, evil people. And this boy wanted just to say no, mm. just like I wanted to say no last week to the very honorable official who I think misspoke, mm -hmm. um, but catastrophically so in my view. Later, maybe a few years later, I was talking <coughs> to a group of um, college students at a, a junior college. Uh, Gaza has many universities and colleges, now many more than even then. And I forget the nature of the, my, my lecture, but six times in the course of that presentation, a pair of questions came verbatim, um, as if my answer to them wasn't heard or just couldn't be accepted. The first of the pair of questions was, do you like Gaza? To which I said, yes, I love Gaza. The second question would be, would you ever come back? Six times, which made me think how profound and how deep this insecurity is, that someone would even 
think were cool or nice, someone would even want to come back. Um, that's Gaza, I think, in a profound way, and that has not changed over the years. Last week, or uh, last month when I was there, this was just a, f a few weeks after the war uh, ended, or they were in ceasefire, uh, in the main ceasefire. Um, Ahmad, a 34-year-old young man who I've known closely for years, uh, came to visit me on my first day. This is, this is another clue to the culture when you arrive. Mm -hmm. and, and your friends know that you're coming. Um, their duty, felt duty, is to come greet you that day, not next day, not later in the week, but that day. And so Ahmad uh, got my phone call that I'd arrived, so he, he made his way from the middle camp area of the Strip, which these days is not an easy journey, um, and it's not cheap. He's got to take a taxi, and it costs a couple shekels, but that's a lot of money in Gaza these days. So he made it, and I, listen, you know, I was curious to see what he would say, what he would talk about, and, and I was prepared in part for a deluge of anguish. Um, Ahmad wanted to talk about his sister, Noor. Uh, he, Ahmad is the oldest of nine children, Noor is the youngest. Um, he was so excited to tell me that Noor had not only passed the Taujihi, which is that awful uh, college qualifying exam that Arabs have to go through, uh, not only had she passed it, but she passed with a 93. Mm -hmm. Now, we know here that a 93 is a stupendous achievement for anyone. Um, I asked Ahmad if he remembered what his score was. <laughs> And he guffawed, and, and, and he said, I had a 51. <laughs> and he passed. I mean, indicating, you know, that's what a passing, that's what success is, 50, 51. And then he went through the list of all of his siblings and gave their scores mm -hmm. in, 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 in order. He was so happy to tell me of her achievement um, and how proud he was of his youngest sister. <coughs> Um, and then came the context. And he said it happened during the war. And that meant we couldn't celebrate for Noor. We couldn't give her the party that she wanted. We couldn't even have candies to pass out to her. That's how Ahmad was suffering, not able to celebrate his sister's incredible achievement on her exam. When I left Jerusalem the day before, a good friend um, gave me some money to, and asked me just to distribute it to whomever I decided would need it. And I gave it to Ahmad. He himself um, needs it, his family needs it, refugee camp family, nine kids now, uh, brothers married lots of uh, extended family. He told me the next day how he used that money. He went directly from seeing me at the hotel and bought Noor a cell phone uh, because she didn't have one and all of her friends had one. And he was unhappy that he couldn't afford the Samsung Galaxy, which she wanted, <laughs> but at least he was able to give her a cell phone. A couple of days later, uh, I spent half of this week, by the way, in, in a common hotel that we stay at on the beach, and the other half in a family home. I was still in this uh, first half, and Hussam came to visit me. He apologized um, on the phone the day before, saying that he really couldn't come on day one, um, which he's never not done before in all of these years. He's always, it's the phone call, okay, I'll be there. Uh, he apologized. The reason he couldn't come the day before was because it was the start of the semester. And he now is an assistant dean of actually the same junior college that I had the six, qu six repeated question pair at. Mm -hmm. And he said, I, I, I just, I'm just so busy. We have 1,700 new students and I've got to make 
you know, the day for them. And, and Hussam is an extremely accomplished uh, a young man. He's now 40. So I first met him when he was um, just out of the first intifada at uh, 20 or so. Uh, he has a PhD, um, and that's an interesting story too. But he, he's really competent. And so he's experiencing what many of you experience perhaps, that is your competence is uh, utilized and you're asked to do a lot. And he, he, he's starting to I indicate that he's really overburdened and this is too much for him. That's why he couldn't come. Uh, he was busy getting school started. When he did come the next day, we sat on the veranda um, of the Dira and um, he told me he was, he was all about the school day, all about the new students, all about the demands and so forth to meet their needs. Remembering for us here that the war was very f still very fresh in their uh, history. And um, he, uh, you know, another clue into Gazan personality is Gazans don't naturally talk about their suffering. You know, it's not something that they wear on their sleeve. This is, I think, Palestinian in general, but Gazan in particular. And for years, I would, I would have to really probe in my interviews with them to, to learn just, just how they were treated in prison or whatever. This is not something that flows forth naturally. They're too humble to do that. Hussam, however, did need to talk about that. So uncharacteristically, he talked about how awful it was for him. His father got the phone call early one morning from the IDF officer. He asked his father, Ferris, uh, <coughs> is, is your door open? Ferris thought, well, what a strange question. No, it's not open. His instruction was to open it and to leave in five minutes, take his family out because his, his house is going to be bombed. Uh, every one of my uh, contacts received that call, either by phone, by text message. But Hussam needed to talk that through a little bit. Um, he is the father of four children. He's the oldest son of a family of eight, and he has therefore kind of management responsibilities as well. They live in the classic Arab home with each floor is a new gener is a different son and it's his family. They had to make decisions. Do we go? Uh, what do we take with us? Where do we go? Uh, they live in Nusarat camp, which is one of the cluster of four middle camps, so in, in the middle of the strip. Uh, his decision, Hussam's decision, was to go take his family, and he decided to go to his in-laws' home. Um, and they left, and the, other, the rest of the family also left. Um, well, the in-laws' home is near the power plant. Mm -hmm. Gaza has one power plant, and it's, it's always the primary target uh, of Israeli Air Force when there's a conflict. And Within days, they didn't feel safe enough even to stay there because it's clearly this was before the plant was bombed. So they left and they went to the next logical place in their mind. And it was a family relative, uh, but unfortunately that home was next to the mosque. New Sarat is, is famous uh, for its resistance in the first intifada and the mosque in New Sarat is was a classic landmark place, and so it's a t it's a target also. Mm. So there they didn't feel safe. So he, he had to talk this through, and they went back home. He took his family back home because his home hadn't been destroyed yet, and uh, he didn't feel safe anywhere else, and it was Friday, and he needed to pray, and uh, he needed, in his mind, needed to be in the mosque praying, and, but he wanted to be with his family, and he didn't know how to handle this, and so he decided he'd take his family back and he put them in the stairwell of, of the main family home because that's the safest place. And then he, then he wanted to go back to the mosque and pray. And his wife pleaded, don't go. And his kids pleaded, don't go. And he went because Hussam, and this is one of the fascinating things when you follow people a long time and, and see how they deal with making life work. Hussam was the leader of 
the communist PFLP in his camp in the First Intifada. He was not a religious man in those days. Um, he never talked about religion in those days. But over the course of his life, he, he's made sense out of the failure of his struggle to find freedom and dignity by turning to religion. So he's a very religious guy now. And it was essential for him to be in the mosque on that Friday praying. And this was just kind of the internal struggle that, um, that was wrenching uh, at, at a very personal level. And he needed to get it out. Um, after a, a, some time during that conversation, he jumped in his chair. And this is also uncharacteristic. So Sam is a very steady, in control guy. And he could see that I didn't understand why he jumped. And, and he said, did you hear that chair? S someone at the other end of the terrace had just gotten up and the chair scratched the floor and it made a screeching sound. And he said, you see, you see, this is the effect on us now. We are still so sensitive to these noises because um, of the recent uh, violence that they experienced. Before long, though, Hussam was off that topic. And he was talking about his PhD. He was talking about school. He was talking about making life work. And if you had joined us at that part of the conversation, you would have said, hey, it's a great young man. He's got ambition, dreams. And you would not have known anything about what he just lived through or what his legacy has been. That describes Gaza, uh, honorable, competent, well-intended, uh, funny, humorous, smiling people who make life work in conditions which we would think would destroy them. I'm worried about them more than I've ever been, even despite all of that hardiness or that goodness, because they are injured more. I mean, Hussam doesn't normally talk like that. So, you know, this, is, this has been a big blow. Um, but, you know, Eshman and Sawi, what, you know, what else can we do? Uh, and yeah. they'll, they're moving forward. Mm. So, Thanks. I have more anecdotes, but that's probably enough. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's a, thank you very much for that. I, um, speaking from personal experience, it's very difficult to try to represent um, what you see in Gaza. And I mean, I can, again, from personal experience, I can say it's been two months out. Um, and I still don't quite feel normal, um, having, having lived through only two weeks of what the people of Gaza have, have lived their entire lives under. Um, so w with that, I mean, I'd like to open it up to questions because we're right about at 10.30. Um, but I, I wanted to pose a very quick question to both of you that perhaps you could take just a minute or two to, to answer. Um, and I'll, I'll ground it in this. When, uh, when I actually, when I left Gaza uh, and went to the West Bank, um, I found that uh, when I told people in Ramallah, for example, Ramallah, which is a very sort of urbane kind of Hong Kong-esque uh, city <laughs> in the sense that there's a lot going on all the time and it doesn't feel like anywhere else right. quite in, in the West Bank. Um, the first time somebody asked me where I had come from, because apparently I looked really haggard and sort of disheveled and, and hadn't shaved in a while, which I, I guess is a pattern for me. Um, <laughs> th I, and I said Gaza, they looked at me like I had come from another planet. And I think it's important to, uh, to sort of contextualize for everyone in this room. When you talk about uh, Gaza and the West Bank, you're talking about places that are roughly the distance of Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, apart from each other. Um, very sim I mean, obviously, we're all Palestinians, and we all speak the same language. But because of the, the Oslo peace process and the permit system um, and the closures uh, of both Gaza and the West Bank, um, anybody in Gaza who is under the age of, I would say, 23 now, because the permit system began in 91, has probably never seen the West Bank, and vice versa. So you're talking about a single nation um, that is very divided in that way. And I wanted to ask. Um, in particular, Alice, when you, when you interacted with people in the West Bank over the course of the war and heard them talk about Gaza, what was your impression of how they viewed things? And also, just really quickly, Brian, if you can give uh, an anecdote or two about the way Gazans viewed the West Bank. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I was actually there before 
the war war started. Okay. Um, right. But I mean, the, the thing that you're mentioning, I think, is very striking. That part of Israeli policy is to keep um, <coughs> Palestinians very divided. <coughs> so there are the West Bank Palestinians. There are the Palestinians living in Israel, which are a whole other category. There are the Gaza Palestinians, and then there is the diaspora. And everybody is very, very separate. Right. Um, but everybody's related. Mm. So it's this. It's. Um, I think it's a very destructive strategy for the community. Um, mm. But clearly, uh, if the you know whatever resolution happens in the future, that's not a viable solution to have. You know, the Israelis have sort of made the Gazans as the bad Palestinians mm. and the West Bankers as the good Palestinians mm. in mm. some way. Um, and so I saw that sort of very clearly in how things were. But I mm. wasn't physically there when the bombs were falling in Gaza. So yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't have a, okay. a good sense of that. Yeah. Brian, it is really an important point that you raised. I mean, it, we we don't appreciate this uh, on the outside, but um, uh, quite literally, uh, well, even back 20 years ago, the one of the most uncomfortable things for me was going from Gaza to Jerusalem, the West Bank, and mm -hmm. having Jerusalemites and West Bankers eagerly pump me for information yeah. on mm -hmm. Gaza, mm -hmm. which was really very strange, especially in the early days when I didn't think I had any expertise, and that's just gotten more extreme, so, so no young mm. Gazan has been, uh, and virtually uh, very few current adult Jerusalemites or West Bankers have ever been to Gaza or haven't been in a decade or more. Mm. So th there is a physical separation, which also carries with it automatically a kind of a psychological separation, because there isn't the kind of uh, union that you would have on a daily basis and so forth. And with all things Palestinian, there are several layers of, of the narrative. We, we are all Palestinians, at, they would say, at one level, and so there is no distinction between West Bankers and Gazans. Mm. At an, uh, another level, uh, there is, and um, um, I think it's fair to say that, that Gazans feel sometimes um, on the lower end of the stick mm -hmm. relative mm -hmm. to their mm -hmm. brothers and sisters in the West Bank and mm -hmm. uh, neglected. Mm. Um, if you want to talk about the PNA, then they feel really betrayed, and et cetera, by um, that whole crazy political setup. Uh, mm. But you no, also see that separation between East Jerusalem sure. Palestinians and West. I mean, people yeah. in the West Bank would say to me, "Well, tell me what Jerusalem feels yeah. like," because they haven't yeah. been able to go to Jerusalem, yeah. which is right next door. Absolutely, yeah. No, I think that's a really important point uh, uh, by way of background. So, um, it, as Brian mentioned, I actually was there during the war. I'm happy to add uh, any any detail or answer any questions that anybody might have for me. But I'm more interested in hearing your questions to uh, Alice and Brian. Uh, given what you just heard. So let's uh, begin with you, sir, please. Are we on? We do have a mic, a yeah. Mic coming right here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've been to many meetings here. My name is Tom Gettman. I'm an NGO executive and lived and worked in the West Bank and Gaza for five years mm -hmm. and was on Skype almost daily with my friends there and heard all the noises of, the, as they say, the voices of the bombs. And even while that was going on, they were telling me, <laughs> the scores of their kids. Um, most of what I did has been destroyed by the IDF. Five to eight million dollars a year. AID money, a lot of it. How did you get in? And what, if you can say with the live stream, or we can talk about it later, later but uh, for those of us that want to go and be of support and walk with our friends again, it's more than just on Skype, how do we do it? How do you, do you do it through UNRWA? Well, again, that's a revealing question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in the old days, uh, yeah. we as Americans would show our passport at a, a very rudimentary checkpoint and get into Gaza that way. Progressively over the years, it's gotten tighter. The, the current situation is uh, the only way for anyone to get into Gaza from the Israeli side. You know, there are two sides, uh, two kind of main pedestrian entry points, one on the Israeli side and one on the Egyptian side. The Egyptian side is now either fully closed or so, so risky that 
uh, I would never recommend that you try to go through the Egyptian side. So you have the choice of going through the Eretz terminal in the north. And now the procedure is, is pretty straightforward. You uh, must have a, a permit from the uh, Israeli Defense Force which permit is granted um, not to you directly, but on behalf uh, to an institution on your behalf. So you have to have an institution in Gaza that is credited by the IDF. That institution, in my case, is the World Health Organization, applies to the IDF and says, we want Barber uh, to come and here are the reasons why. Mm -hmm. The IDF will grant that or not, and if they do, uh, it's a six-month multiple entry visa and it's all done electronically um, by the institution and the IDF and then you get an email saying they turned you down or they accepted it and and then uh, for the last couple of years uh, Hamas is trying trying to act like a government so they also require an entry permit so either that same institution or another one has to apply to a Ham the Hamas, gov Hamas government on your behalf same situation but their permit is, permit is is good for a year, multiple entry, and then when you show up at the various stages of the IRS terminal, you have to, uh, you're the, either in the Israeli computer, and so you don't have any document you need to show them. Yeah. Um, and progressively, your, your, your Hamas has you in the computer, although the last time I went in a few weeks ago, they're, not surprisingly, the power was out and their <laughs> computers were down, and so it was a little bit delayed, but. Um, that's the only way to get in with those two permits and uh, you have to be lucky enough to be connected with an organization in yeah. Gaza which you are with yeah. dozens uh, um, but that's the process and it takes um, on paper it takes five weeks that, um, uh, to process that sometimes it comes quicker sometimes it doesn't by the way this is the first time I've cried at an America Foundation <laughs> Ah. It's understandable. It really is. Um, I'll, I'll just add to what Brian said that there is one other way to get in, and that's as a, as a journalist, obviously. Um, and the reason I'll mention it is because it's quite striking that um, it's not an automatic process, right? You actually have to get... I've tried twice. You've tried twice, right? So you have to apply through the government press office in, in West Jerusalem. And you may or may not get in, depending on the mood and the politics of the, on that given day. Um, the other thing to mention very quickly is that if, if you are not a foreign passport holder, in other words, if you're a Palestinian from the West Bank or East Jerusalem, you don't stand a chance in hell of getting into Gaza, no matter what process you go through. Or a Jewish Israeli. Or a Jewish Israeli, for that matter, yeah. Um, and then also, Brian, I should mention that Hamas was non-existent when I went. They um, literally, like, the, I mean, the building had been bombed at the mm -hmm. border, and so there was nobody there. Um, we just walked right in. Uh, but it's a very good point. And, and as a humanitarian worker, I think that uh, it must be that much more frustrating for you to be able to, to not be able to get in easily. What other questions do we have? Anyone else? Yes, sir. Yeah, I just kind of a little bit shocked. I mean, I agree, I agree with whatever you, know, you said in terms of a tragedy. Mm. But there's zero, zero point zero zero percent empathy toward the Israeli position, or to the huge mistakes that the citizens of Gaza made in voting for Hamas, which I'd like to remind you, for example, they have TV shows where they talk about the beauty of killing Israelis. What a marvelous Jewish Israelis, of course. So there's two sides to the argument. Now the main issue here isn't who's right or who's wrong. The main issue here is what do we do? And by having zero empathy toward the Israelis, you're not contributing to a solution to the problem. You're making it worse. So what I'm trying to say is, let's see both sides, and let's see what we can do to help the situation, which unfortunately, well, for at least from this conversation, you're not contributing anything positive. Mm. Thank you for your question. I think I'll give that one to Alice. <laughs> 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 Go ahead. I have a thing or two to say, but okay. I'll let you start. Go ahead. Um, so um, where to start? So I think that um, you know, we were asked today to talk about what was going on in the West Bank and Gaza. Mm -hmm. And um, it's very easy to blame the victim. Um, and so my comments are trying to humanize 
what's happening to Palestinians. But also, this whole thing happens in a context. I mean, when you talk about the fact that Palestinians voted for Hamas, if you look at the polls that were done about why they did that, they did not vote for Hamas to drive the Israelis into the sea. They did not vote for Hamas because they supported suicide bombing. Uh, it was actually a vote against Fatah, which was having issues around corruption and also had been totally unsuccessful at reaching some kind of peace accord. And in a world where democratic process is respected, a election that is you know, verified by Jimmy Carter, yada, 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 would have been respected. And then Hamas would have had to have the opportunity to try to govern. And as we know, there are terrorist organizations, and I will go back to you know, the Irgun and the Stern Gang, um, that turn people into prime ministers when they get a state. So we have no idea what Hamas would have done had it had the chance to govern. It's also an organization that is not monolithic. It's an organization that has um, built schools and hospitals and done a tremendous amount of social service work for the population that is largely forgotten. And so the context is that there's this election and then Gaza's put under this horrific siege. And I think, you know, you can say Hamas has done all these horrible things and all this stuff, but the point is that this is all happening in a context of a siege which is brutal, which has destroyed the economy. Um, that you know, people talk about it as an open-air prison, which I think is actually the wrong metaphor, because in a prison, the guards are actually responsible for feeding the prisoners. And in Gaza, the guards are not responsible for anything. So Israel gets all the control without the responsibility. So I do think it's important. Of course, Israelis cannot tolerate rockets raining down on their heads. But I do think it's very important to remember the context in which this is happening. Um, and that would be my mm. two cents to this conversation, sure. I don't know what you think. Correct. Yeah, I, I think that, um, first of all, I should mention that I write for an Israeli magazine, and my colleagues are almost without exception uh, Israeli Jews who are born and raised in Israel. Um, and one of them comes to mind immediately because he served in the IDF for four years, um, and then was a conscientious objector and spent consequently two years in prison for doing so, for refusing to serve in the West Bank. And one of his frustrations upon coming to America and trying to speak to Americans, and in particular American Jews, about the issue is that there seems to be a kind of black and white, um, uh, I would call it almost fanaticism here, about what Israelis think or don't think. Um, and I think what, as a Palestinian, my experience has been that when you speak to Israeli Jews who actually live on the land, um, that there's a far more nuanced understanding of what's possible in terms of peace and in terms of conflict resolution. Um, and frankly, the most glaring example of that is the fact that Benjamin Netanyahu himself um, is negotiating with Hamas, despite the fact that there is this grandiose rhetoric about wanting to uh, you know, crush them and, and, and basically put an end to this reign of terror in Gaza. Um, it is he, Benjamin Netanyahu, who has chosen to negotiate with Hamas on every occasion that he has bombed them. And so that says something to you about what is actually happening behind the scenes. And I think it's important to distinguish between the rhetoric and the reality. And as I say, it's Israeli Jews themselves who uh, are perhaps the best barometer of that. I would urge you please to go to our magazine. It's called 972 um, and, and read some of the voices on there because they're really quite intelligent and, and I think forward thinking. We just need to take questions. From, I, I apologize, I'd be happy to talk to you after it. I'm sure our panelists would as well. Yeah. Please, yes ma'am. Hi, I'm Delinda Hanley from the Washington Report. Hi, and um, I, our Gaza correspondent says he can hear Egyptian bulldozers and um, bulldozing along the border, Rafah border, and Gazans really think Israel is coming back to finish the job um, mm -hmm. now. And Egypt is clearing a buffer zone to make it easier. Would you comment on that? Brian, would you like to? Um, I, I'll say w say what I can. Um, I don't I don't know you know the day-to-day -day details of that, but I can say from uh, from a perspective of Gazans um, that the uh, behavior of the Egyptian government towards them in the last year or two has been enormously uh, uh, disappointing and frustrating. So I was there December um, last. 
Um, it was during that awful storm, which also flooded uh, much of the region, but uh, CC had closed the tunnels already then. And uh, already there were power outages uh, on the order of eight to 12 hours a day. Uh, and that, from the Gazan perspective, is the fault of Egypt. And so wh whatever is happening, they certainly feel abandoned. Um, and uh, there's every reason, uh, it's obvious to everyone, um, that um, the Egyptian and Israeli government are, are quite of one mind mm. on, on Gaza. And the Gazans are very clear about knowing that. Mm. Yeah, um, also, if you look at the pattern of the behavior of the Israeli government, they talk about you know, putting the Gazans on a diet but not starving them mentality or um, that the solution is a contained conflict solution. So, you know, again, I don't know what the Israeli government's thinking about, but their trend has been to just keep things at a particular level. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that they may be aware that completely wiping out every Gazan might not be good for their reputation. Um, mm. Not that what's happening is good for their reputation, but that's mm. my sort of impression of the trend. Delinda, I was, I was on the phone uh, just yesterday with my colleague um, with whom I stayed, actually, when I was there. Um, and it was just after someone had lobbed, apparently, a mortar across the border, attempted to, right? I, I think it was, that happened a couple of days ago. Um, and his sense was that more of that is going to happen, and it's likely to elicit you know, the, the kind of horrific violence that we saw last summer. I don't think anyone is expecting this to be a long-term truce. Um, and his characterization of it was that in, in 2012 and in 2008, 2009, after Cass led, there was at least a sense that there was some rebuilding taking place, if not two months after, then at least, you know, within a reasonable amount of time. Um, and given the destruction that Brian described, which essentially, I mean, we have to, we have to remember we're talking about more than 100,000 people displaced in a, in a territory that, as you p pointed out, Alice, is 25 miles long and six miles at its girth. Um, so these people have nowhere to go. And the, the sense of despair now, in addition to the rains, in addition to the cold, um, is likely to lead uh, to more frustration and possibly more of the kind of lobbying of mortars and rockets that, that we saw a couple of days ago. Um, what other questions, comments, reactions? Yes, sir, Mr. Sunka. Hi, thank you. I'm Howard Sumka. Um, it, it's hard to ask a question when, when you hear the stories about the people who are caught in this kind of awful warfare, because what is, what is there to ask? I mean, we, we, we know how awful the stories are. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk for two minutes about my experience. Uh, I was the director of USAID from 2006 to 2010. Uh, the USAID responsibility is West Bank and Gaza. We were based in Israel for security reasons. Um, and maybe after I talk for a minute or two, I'll think of a question, mm -hmm. or maybe you'll think of a response. Um, during the period from 2006, 2007, we had a half a dozen staff in Gaza, local staff, not, not internationals, uh, who were monitoring and running our programs there. In 2007, when, um, the war between Hamas and Fatah took, I, I don't know you want to call it a war, the, the, the Ramallah Palestinians call it the coup, the, I, don't know, I don't know what Hamas refers to it as. Five of those six staff chose to leave Gaza. Uh, three of them had dual passports, and one's in Canada, and one's in California, and one works for the World Bank, uh, and, and uh, another we were able to get two others. We were able to get into the West Bank with permits. And mm -hmm. if you work for the US government and you have good connections to the Israeli government, you can, in fact, get Gazans between Gaza and the West Bank. Um, that period was awful for them. And this, I mean, at least the immediate actions had nothing to do with Israel. They had to do with Hamas and Fatah. And, and we all remember how awful that brief but intense engagement was. In 2008, we still had one staff person left in Gaza, a, a woman who was very committed to trying to make things better for Gazans, who was very committed to the USAID agenda, who had five, 
six children, uh, one of whom had actually been killed in the conflict some years back, uh, and she remained committed. In 2008, during Operation Cast Lead, her neighborhood came under attack, and we were literally on the phone with the IDF, monitoring her movements, trying to get her into an area, her and her family, into an area that was not going to come under shelling. Uh, and we managed, and she survived that. Um, but not long after that, sometime around 2010, just after I left, she began to get intensive abuse from Hamas uh, and from people affiliated with Hamas or sympathetic to Hamas to the point that no matter how committed she remained, she couldn't, she couldn't stay anymore. And she and another Gazan uh, are living in the West Bank now and still working for USAID and still going into Gaza from time to time. So, you know, the lives of Gazans have just from years back been subjected to this kind of, of, of terror that, that comes with, with the conflict. And it's not just the Israelis, but it is mostly the Israelis, clearly. Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm not sure when you understand all of that what you do with it. I think the most important thing to do with it is to take it not to audiences like this where probably everybody in this room is sympathetic with what you're saying, but to take it out into the mainstream American Jewish community and to try to make that message clear to them. Uh, I was, had the privilege a week ago to be on a panel with Gershon Baskin in a mainstream Jewish community in Massachusetts. Um, and what he said and what I said was, was really eye-opening to, uh, to this audience. And I think we need to find more ways to open their eyes and, and to make the point clear. But what this gentleman said I think is absolutely true. You can't deliver that message and be heard if the message you're delivering is Israel's all bad and Palestinians for 60 years have been nothing but innocent victims. I mean, we know neither of those things is true. And so the question is, how do you craft that message? So I have a question. How would you propose <laughs> to go out to the mainstream Jewish community and deliver that message uh, in a way that it can be heard? Thank you. Thank you, Howard. So I, I, I should point <laughs> out that the last time I saw Alice was actually in Charlotte, North yeah, Carolina. Yeah. Is that where we were? At a, uh, at a Baptist convention, yeah. speaking about Gaza. And so I, I completely agree with you on that point. There are several that I disagree with you on, but mm -hmm. let me let Alice speak to the, to the question sure. of uh, the how we community. reach the mainstream, okay. especially the Jewish community. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I do spend a lot of energy trying to reach the Jewish community, which I feel sort of personally responsible for being Jewish. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a lot of really painful things about my attempts. Um, What's happened in the Jewish community over the last couple of decades is that, um, and this I think started when the Anti-Defamation League defined the new anti-Semitism as any critical statements about Israel, which happened in 1974, is that people who express uh, criticism of Israeli policy are uh, labeled as self-hating Jews. I mean, we're sort of cast out of the tribe. And so, um, the net result of that is that people like me are not welcome in the mainstream Jewish community. Mm -hmm. And there are actually, um, uh, I don't know if people are familiar with the Reut Institute, a Reut Institute, R-E-U-T, it's a think tank in Tel Aviv, um, that has issued, um, you know, has had all these strategy meetings with uh, U.S. and Israeli PR firms and all sorts of uh, government agencies. Um, and the goal is to craft a message about how wonderful Israel is, to give a good Israeli brand, mm -hmm. and then to go after people who have any criticism. So my experience of being able to speak in the Jewish community is that there's this increasing level of what feels to me uh, sort of McCarthy-esque kind of tactics um, to shut people like me up. So, you know, I was just speaking <coughs> at um, a college where um, some folks from the Hillel uh, had a big uh, kerfluffle about my coming to the campus and actually complained uh, that my presence on campus made Jewish students feel unsafe, which gives you a level of, a sense of the level of lack of tolerance for any discourse 
on this. And they actually, you know, went all the way to the head of the department who said, you know, we actually have free speech in this campus, so she's going to speak anyway. Um, and I was just at another campus where some alumni said that if I was allowed to do a book reading that they would never give another donation to the campus. Mm -hmm. So, um, and if you look at people who are actually get their livings from academia, which I fortunately don't, uh, you know, people are being monitored by their students with organizations like Campus Watch and David Project and Camera, and people are losing their jobs and not getting tenure. And so there is this um, incredible sort of squelching of intelligent discourse and critical discourse on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Um, and I think this is enormously troublesome and enormously bad for the Jewish community. Um, for me, the most sort of optimistic thing that's happening is uh, that um, a group of students who are involved with Hillel, um, which is a Jewish campus-based organization that has centers for Jewish life in campuses all across uh, North America. Um, it did start out as a non-Zionist organization, but it evolved into being um, a sort of um, Israel-promoting organization. And they actually have um, you know, rules of discourse. You're not allowed to have speakers that have the following XYZ opinions, um, which is, again, very um, intolerant and McCarthy-esque. And so students, being students and being smart and reading whatever they want to read, have finally said, wait a minute, we're not going to follow these rules. This is ridiculous. Um, it's also very un-Jewish. I mean, Jews are supposed to argue with each other. We have a Talmudic tradition where we argue until we're blue, you know? And so to suddenly be told you're not allowed to argue about these particular topics um, doesn't feel right. So um, students in Swarthmore, uh, Vassar, and Wesleyan launched an open Hillel movement where they said we're not going to abide by the rules of the Hillel International. And about a month ago, they had their first national conference in Boston at Harvard. I was there. I was one of the speakers. And it was fabulous. There were 350 students. You know, they weren't all politically the same, but they wanted to have the right to have these conversations. And so for me, things like that are the most uh, optimistic things going on mm -hmm. in the Jewish community. But it's yeah. a real struggle. And I think honing the message is also difficult because, I mean, I'll say things and people will accuse me of supporting suicide bombing. You know, it's like I have to say, you know, Israel does good things. I don't support a suicide bombing. I have to go through my whole sort of bowing down to all the things that are obviously true mm -hmm. to be able to say anything critical. And so that's sort of the tone of discourse in the Jewish community. In, I'm talking mainstream Jewish community. And it is very difficult and troubling. But more people are struggling mm -hmm. against it. And there are also um, groups like Jewish Voice for Peace, um, which tripled in size during the Gaza war. And so every time there's something troublesome that happens in that region, uh, organizations like Jewish Voice for Peace get more and more people joining. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll just close with this. The um, director of Jewish Voice for Peace said that in the last Gaza war, she got an email from a rabbi that just said, enough, sign me up. Mm. And I think that's sort of a trend that's going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not mainstream, but it is a trend. Yeah, absolutely. I would urge everyone to check out Jewish Voice for Peace, by the way. Brian, I wanted to give you a chance to talk, speak to that, but we also have other questions. Would you mind if I... No, please. It? Okay. Um, Yes, ma'am, over there in the, uh, sorry, with the uh, dark, right there, yeah, exactly. Hi, uh, my name is Allison Glick, and I am a member of Jewish Voice for Peace, and I would just say a couple of things. First of all, to um, the gentleman, Howard, was that his name, from USAID? First of all, I think we have to speak honestly about what happened in Gaza uh, back after Hamas was elected. I would refer everyone here to the April 2008 article in Vanity Fair by David Rose about U.S. government involvement in um, supporting a military uh, push by Fatah against Hamas. So once again, we see American government uh, hand in a kind of, uh, I think David Rose described it as a, a Bay of Pigs operation in Gaza. So let's uh, talk uh, honestly and, and with the facts, first of all. And I would just um, second what Alice said about the Jewish community. I think the other thing to point out is um, the best way to reach American people and the Jewish community is to talk about the facts on the ground. And misrepresenting talking about the reality in Gaza is somehow being one-sided is only adding to the obfuscation and the um, misguided U.S. policy that we've seen for the past many decades. So um, I, I, would just <clears throat> I would just support what Alice says 
and reiterate also that within the Jewish community, not only are things changing, but if you look at the demographics and you look um, at what's happening, for example, with Open Hillel, young Jews especially are leaving um, the traditional Jewish organizations in this country in droves. Um, and I think that that needs to be a wake-up call to the mainstream Jewish community, to these traditional organizations, because um, clearly the future is not with them as they, if they continue to pursue these policies and to use these McCarthy-like uh, tactics to try to silence those of us who want to see what's really going on. So I think you know there are polls that show that um, if you look at, for instance, Jews like me who are over 65, there's almost 100% stand with Israel, right or wrong. And as you go down the age level, you get more and more dissent. So when you hit uh, 35 and under, more than 50% of Jewish Americans do not really care about what happens to Israel, and many are also uh, sympathetic to Palestinian issues. So you see that in polls as well. Mm. So I, I'm so I, I, we're going to have to wrap up the questions now, and if you have any other uh, conversation points you'd like to bring up with the panelists, you can do so after. Um, but Brian, I want to give you the last word because uh, you and I, you teach at the University of Tennessee and that happens to be my alma mater. <laughs> and so I know quite well that um, in, in Tennessee there's a very different conversation going on uh, from the one that we're having up here. And in many ways uh, it offers more opportunity, I think, for the kind of outreach that, the, that uh, you were speaking about, Howard. Um, so I recall that during, I think it was actually during the war, you had written an op-ed and we were trying to place it, and I think one of the places, like instead of going to the New York Times or the Washington Post, I think you thought about going to the Tennessean. Well, um, the Post turned us down. So. Well, the Post turned, well, the Post turned <laughs> us down as well, yeah. But, but talk to us a little bit about that. I mean, what's it like trying to bring the message back home? I understand you're from LA, but you know, given what you know about Tennessee and other places like it. It's really a, our most difficult task, as I see it, is how to communicate about what at some level seem to be very complex issues. At another level though, as I kind of grow up in this enterprise of trying to make sense out of this, it, it becomes more simple for me. Maybe that's because I've reached the limits of my <laughs> capacity to contemplate this. But, you know, to s you can sum up the, the pain of Gazans, again, it applies to all Palestinians, but I I'll speak for Gazans. You can sum it up quite simply. Uh, it isn't about bombs. It isn't about uh, home destructions necessarily. It's about dignity. Yeah. It's about feeling violated. It's about not having the freedom to call yourself a people, to express yourself, to move to, to whatever it may be. But it's really about honor and dignity, and, and it, I'm, I'm grateful for the co comment or question earlier, in part because um, uh, Gazans are uh, sensitive to those issues regardless of who is the person controlling those things. So there's a lot of anger and there's a lot of fear against Hamas, for example, within Gaza. Uh, Hamas is, n is not a gentle, um, uh, government in many ways. I think they're getting a little bit wiser, but um, they have violated uh, the rights of their own people, which is doubly uh, <coughs> insulting. Um, and so if we, if I think if we want to understand the, the gut level of this, that's the level that we have to talk about. So my effort is going to try to be to humanize that level of experience and suffering. This is about basic things that every one of us in this room w w would demand if we didn't have them. Mm. And these are people who are demanding them. And that would apply whether you're a Palestinian, a Gazan, an Israeli, it doesn't matter. If, if those rights, if those fundamental basic freedoms are being denied, then we need to talk about them everywhere. Uh, okay. Really quickly, yeah, Really, please. really quickly. Yeah. So I also think this is not a conflict that's over there. It's something that's affecting us. So if you look mm -hmm. at it, if we're spending $3 billion in military aid, that's money that's not being used in our own country for schools, 
built roads, whatever, okay? Um, our police are being trained in Israel on how to do effective crowd control. So you see Ferguson to Palestine, there's a sort of militarization of our police departments. Our prison system is increasingly a privatized system. G4S builds our prisons, they build Israeli prisons, they've been accused of torture in Israeli prisons. The wall between Mexico and the US is partly built by Israeli companies. I mean, these are not theoretical uh, issues that are happening in some far off crazy place. They have really come home and I think you know, it's important to remember that as well. Excellent point. And on that note, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.